This is an important panel because it's one I've looked forward to. Uh, and the two ladies here are going to enlighten us over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, I'm simply going to ask a series of questions of them. They will answer. Uh, and if any of you here in the audience want to ask a question afterwards, we might have two or three minutes to do so. But I wouldn't worry about it too much. So let me start by asking um, the ladies. Uh, Anne, would you like to introduce yourself? Followed by you, please. Uh, sure. Michelle. Um, Ann Mon Johnson. I'm the CEO of the ATA, the American Telemedicine Association. And we're based in Washington, D.C. And we're the only organization that's focused exclusively on the promotion, advancement, embedding telehealth in how we do healthcare. Our membership includes over 400 organizations, delivery systems, payers, physician groups, and then a range of solution providers, many of whom became household words during the pandemic. So it's a privilege to be here. It's great to be with Michelle. And, and truthfully, I didn't realize how much we had in common. So it'll be fun to have this conversation. Thank you. Yes, yes. And I am Dr. Michelle Griffith. I am an internal medicine and uh, lifestyle medicine doctor by training, been practicing for over 30 years. I am now the president of the International Society for Telemedicine and eHealth. It's based in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, it's been in existence for 27 years. I happen to be the first US president. Uh, we've had historically over 110 countries and territories under our umbrella. We are a recognized non-state actor uh, with the World Health uh, Organization. And our mission has been over the last uh, 25, 27 years, excuse me, uh, to really facilitate the international dissemination of education, knowledge, and expertise in the field of telemedicine and e-health, and also to provide access to experts globally in the field of telemedicine. Thanks very much. I've been told to sit in this seat by the uh, AV guys. So as you all know by now, I always do what I'm told. Um, so first of all, thank you ladies for joining us. You can see the title of this, and I personally am curious about telehealth and the future of telehealth in particular. Uh, and I, I'm not just looking at my emails because I want to check uh, whether I need to answer one. I'm actually doing to remind me of the questions I posed to the, to the ladies a couple of weeks ago. Honestly, that's true. Um, so let me begin. We all saw during the pandemic a huge surge in the use of telehealth, right? I'd love to know what happened afterwards and has it just simply died away because COVID, according to some people, has died away even though it hasn't. So, Anne, do you want to start? Sure. So we get asked that question a lot because, of course, we saw the hockey stick and then it did drop. I would say a few things. Number one is that at the during the height of the pandemic, people really tried telehealth. So the numbers are really astronomical in terms of 90%, 95% trying it. So we got over this hurdle of our technology being around for so long, 30 years, and yet people had never tried it before. So we got past that point. I think the other is that people were pleasantly surprised by how well it went for them. And so a lot of satisfaction across different age groups of citizens or consumers, as well as different age groups of clinicians and different specialties. And now we're at the point where we're learning how it all works. And so I would not take the drop as anything more of just trying to figure out how we integrate this and really acknowledge that telemedicine is not a sideshow, it's healthcare. And it's really incumbent on us to make sure that we use it as a modality of care where and when it's needed. So in person is not possible or it's not necessary. This should be something that's broadly accepted around the United States as well as around the world. So I see the drop as more of a reflection of how people are normalizing their lives. I also, and I know we'll talk about this, I think the user experience across the board is phenomenally lacking. That's one word of describing it. 
And I would say then because of that, we see people creating their own hybrid expand, experience, their own omni-channel experience. And we will make that easier and easier for them. So I think that um, to believe that we can get by as a society without using technology, without using technology-enabled care is quite frankly elitist and it's not sustainable. We cannot have in-person one-to-one for everyone, no matter where you are. It's just doesn't work. We don't have the numerics for it. So I'm not discouraged. I'm pathologically optimistic. <laughs> yes, I would, um, I would um, say or add to that. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, our efforts were really focused on just increasing patient awareness about the um, availability of telemedicine and what it could do to improve uh, health outcomes, uh, to increase access to care. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, physicians, uh, generally speaking, you saw, or even consumer utilization in the single digits. Uh, and we know healthcare, unfortunately, tends to be an industry that is the last to embrace technology. Uh, if it wasn't for the Affordable Care Act, even physicians uh, would not be uh, using the EMR electronic medical records like we're doing today without that actually being legislated and uh, you know incurring penalties if we did not um, adhere to those new um, requirements. So um, now that we are in this uh, post-pandemic era, we've certainly seen um, a surge in utilization um, people now see the convenience of um, telehealth visits. We know that 75, 80% of outpatient visits really can be done virtually. So we're certainly not looking to replace um, in-person visits. We, I don't think we could ever do that. Uh, I don't know how you would diagnose uh, an ap <laughs> appendicitis or a cholecystectomy just based upon someone complaining of abdominal pain virtually. But uh, really what we're looking at is the uh, integrated um, clinical blended model, right? Um, integrating our digital health tools into our current health ecosystems um, to improve access to care. And that's what we're seeing globally. We've seen a surge in um, the implementation and interest in digital health. And our organizations uh, are very much, I would say we're a lot busier now, um, and we've kind of shifted a tad bit uh, post-pandemic. Uh, it is something that we've always wanted. You know, we're beyond the tipping point, and I'm excited about um, what these digital health tools can do uh, in so many different arenas, so many different arenas. Can Thanks I, very much. Can I just add on that just for a second? Because I think we would both agree that it's more than access and convenience. And if that's all we stand on, then that's just not enough. I think it's really a question of devel de delivering a high quality experience. So there's been a lot of studies that have come out in the last two and a half years about what the impact has been. So it's high quality health care that's provided. It's a great or it's a better user experience. I would say that the outcomes are as good, if not better, in many instances with virtual services. So our opportunity really is to make sure that we paint as broad and as deep a case for virtual and telehealth as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And actually the VA, the Veterans yeah. Administration, has already proven that. I mean, it's the only, it's probably the largest healthcare system that had, where we have public access to data. And back in, two, I mean, from 2012, you can see the benefit of, of these digital health tools. So the data is there. Uh, we just have to uh, make people aware and, and act upon it. And I would agree, um, all the digital health tools that we see now, they're exciting. But if we do not focus on the end user, um, then they will just remain bells and whistles, right? Because it's all about the human connection. No matter what we do in this digital health space, it really is about our patient or consumer and the healthcare worker and physician or provider on that other end. So providing that training necessary uh, to ensure that they don't have just accessibility, but comfortability, right? With the tools that we are now implementing uh, for the benefit of all. So as you probably gather, I was quite happy to be the moderator of this panel. I'm not sure why I'm here actually, because when these two ladies get together, 
You can't get a word in edgeways. <laughs> um, but <laughs> moving on, because you've led me directly into my next question, which is um, what I'm interested in is I, I understand the point about the drop and, and we should, shouldn't be too worried about that. What I'm interested in is, is telehealth going to be much more than a Zoom call? Is it actually going to ha become a permanent part of the uh, integrated care system? And if so, how are you going to do that? Do you want me to go first? Of course. You, am I allowed? Well, I mean, you, okay. You, don't worry, Michelle will jump in anyway, but you carry on. on. Well, <laughs> at the ATA, we define telehealth very broadly. And okay. so it's synchronous. It's the Zoom call or FaceTime, which is not HIPAA compliant, by the way. Um, it's also asynchronous. It's chat. And it's remote monitoring. The whole idea of enabling people, you know, this idea of, the living room is the exam room of the future or the hospital at home, as well as all the components that make it happen. So AI, AR, VR, I mean, these are all different components and flavors of telehealth. And again, I think we're gonna be pleasantly surprised by the number of use cases that continue to surface, that are reliable, that are bona fide, and so, no, it's not just the video call. And uh, it's exciting to see where it's going. No, I agree with her response, really. There's not much to add there. Uh, certainly, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. The, the remote system. monitoring. I mean, no, really, there's just the gamut of, yeah. which is why, you know, initially we used to talk about telemedicine and e-health um, quite frequently. But now our terminology has changed very much to, to digital health, right? Because it incorporates so many different aspects and tools um, in this space, so. I would agree. Yeah. So two points I want to make um, from other parts of the world. I remember before COVID, um, I was working in Scotland with an organization I'm involved in. We had spent a year and a half trying to persuade the Scottish government that they should try telehealth. And they said, oh, don't know about that. So after we went through all the procedures, they eventually agreed they would give us a pilot, you know, the usual pilot. It was going to be for a maximum of six months. They said, we think you're too optimistic. You're going to get at least a thousand users a month. So he said, let's start. I'm a great believer in starting something. If you've got momentum, you can always change direction. Uh, otherwise, you're dead in the water. COVID hit. Within four weeks, they came to us and said, you know that telehealth idea? I think we need it. And I said, yeah, what do we do? We introduced them to one of our members based in Melbourne, Australia, in our ecosystem there, who have been using it throughout Australia for the last 10 years. And it was a fast track to get them to come into Scotland uh, and to institute it. So the pilot went out of the, out of the door. Uh, I was asked, how much will it cost to do this for the next 12 months? So we came up with a figure, uh, my organization did, and as a result, we ended up with, I think it was 39,000 calls a month in the first weeks of COVID. And then the government said, well, we don't really need to do that anymore now that COVID's gone. So the population rose up and said, what? You mean I have to go and see a doctor in the future? So I think it's about that experience, you know, it may have dropped now, but the fact is people like the convenience, they like the ability but what they're also beginning to do, as you two were saying, is it's really important that they get additional services on it. It's not just a Zoom call, as you say, and it's, it's about saying, what else can I do online? And there are times, as you say, where you have to go and see the doctor. Uh, but it's very interesting. The final one was Ireland, where telehealth was effectively banned by the doctors. Why? Because the law in Ireland was and this is what the law said. The doctor gets paid for seeing the patient. No one had defined what seeing the patient means. This law was written 60, 70 years ago. So the government said, what are we gonna do? And I said, change the law. It's not as easy as you think. And I said, well, why don't we just do it? And you change the law as soon as you catch up. And that's exactly what they did. So the doctors were then gonna be reimbursed for seeing you online. And that removed a major obstacle and now it's become a permanent part of the delivery of care. So I think important, le different lessons around the world, but yeah. similar, I think, wherever you are. The next question was, who pays? 
I know it varies dramatically from country and continent, but I'm interested in, and I know you, your organization does a lot of work in, I don't know if you call it lobbying over here, if that's the right word. It's probably I have to watch my words, I suppose, but it's lobbying. And I know you're always, uh, they're trying to persuade legislators to include telehealth as a paid service. Do you want to bring us up to date on where you are in the States and that? So it's a great question. And we get asked the question a lot about reimbursement in the United States, which really is an impediment in many instances. Yeah. So I'll make a couple of points. The first is that as an association, yes, we do lobby, but it's through our affiliated trade organization, ATA Action. So ATA is a 501c3, and then ATA Action is a 501c6. And we created it because we wanted to have no limits on the amount of lobbying that we could do. The way we did it was modeled after AARP. And what they had done was they created guidelines or principles so that the lobbying arm of AARP would not go rogue and wouldn't go counter to the mission of the organization. We have policy principles that we adhere to that telehealth is health, that were venue, modality, and device agnostic. And so the action arm of the ATA stays within those policy principles. So kudos to AARP. Um, I will also say that as an association with our very diverse membership that we really are not able to lobby or advocate for a specific type of reimbursement because we have such a diverse membership. Instead, we talk about fair market or fair payment for services. However, we also believe that as important as value-based care programs are and a way of really ushering in telehealth, we wanna make sure that telehealth and all the impediments and the barriers in place or that were in place prior to the pandemic are removed because if we wait for value-based care to be instituted across the United States for all payers, all ways of delivering services, we will be older and grayer than we already are. And I think fee for service is still gonna be around for a long time. And so this is why I'm excited about the advent of consumerism and the embrace of telehealth by consumerism and consumers and citizens across the country. Sorry, if you have any experience, uh, from around the rest of the world. Yeah, I was gonna say, of course, that that's, quite variable. Uh, when you look at low, middle, and high income countries, um, reimbursement um, and how that actually is uh, implemented varies. So um, the higher income countries like the US and EU, the private sector is very robust. So, and things tend to move a tad bit faster um, in the private sector than in the public sector. Um, but I will say in continents, you know, the African continent, uh, when you talk about the Caribbean and other low middle income countries, it is very important to have um, your government or as a stakeholder, if you want it to go anywhere. So government plays a significant role um, in the ability to actually move the implementation of digital health forward. And we're seeing that there is so much activity going on in Africa right now, a hotbed of digital health implementation. Um, we just had a conference in the Caribbean. It was the first digital health conference uh, in the Caribbean. And Jamaica has quite a bit going on there as well. They just um, invested $50 million in uh, improving digital technology in their hospitals. And they've already expanded to some local clinics, 11 local clinics, so really that hub and spoke uh, model. So um, a lot of exciting things going on around the world, but definitely government plays a, a much more centralized role when we look at countries around the world. Thank you. Uh, when we were in Mumbai, we were there together at the Raj, you heard him earlier, uh, the Global Digital Summit, it was fascinating to hear the statistics and the numbers because very soon India will have more people who have electronic medical records than the population of the US. Then you turn to Rwanda uh, and you look at the, the number of people there who have got medical records. 
uh, in um, places like India, they come proudly and say to you, have you seen my medical record? And I said, I don't really want to see your medical record. But they're saying with pride they can access, as, as Raj was saying. So I think there's a, this, is, this is not, uh, and that's what my first question was, it's not going away. It's actually become part of the norm. Uh, and as Anne said, this is going to be the norm. We just have to keep pushing hard and not giving up. We're going to run out of time, uh, as always. I could talk to the two ladies or listen to them all day, um, but we can't. So we're going to finish by simply saying, I should say, Anne is a founding member of our council, which is the Global Health Connector. So you have the partners from around the world sitting there and giving this intelligence and input into everything we do. So it's a question of informing each other of what each other's doing and then collaborating and we're collaborating very closely now with Michelle and her organization in lots of specific aspects, the word being specific, uh, as we discussed. And, and I think that partnership and collaboration is where the world will benefit and we will benefit as well.